Hello my lovely students and welcome to the final video lesson of lockdown as I'm about to go on maternity leave and this is going to take you through the last couple of weeks lessons. So right at the end of term here we've got time to do the first part of the myth and religion unit foundation stories or myth and the city foundation stories. So we're going to be looking at the Greek foundation stories featured in the course. These ones are mainly to do with Athens. So we've got the naming of Athens with Athene and Poseidon and we've also got a Theseus's labours and Theseus is a Greek hero but he does have specific links to Athens. So our two foundation myths as I've said already the naming of Athens. This is the competition between Athene and Poseidon to become Athens as patron and we've also got the adventures of Theseus a king of Athens who unified Attica under Athens. Why first of all were foundation myths important to a city and how do we know that they were important? Now if you're a student of mine you'll be following along by adding notes into your note sheets and I've organised it so you can put the notes in to two separate sections. So let's look first of all why they were important. Well, first of all, they link the human cities with the gods that those cities and the people there worshipped. And we know that if you are religious, you need that link between you and your god in order to feel safe and in order to feel uh, happy. Um, and whether or not the stories were true or even why the people really believed the stories, they still gave the populace something to be proud of. It gave them the chance to be patriotic to their city and it unified the people behind one idea. How do we know they were important? Well, the fact that they were passed down through the oral tradition by, you know, verbally uh, for many years before finally being written down does tell us that they were important because that's the sort of information that is important, the information that is passed around. Otherwise, it clearly isn't important because it would have been lost over time. And there were also different versions of similar stories linking more than one divinity or one hero to a city. So the fact that people changed the stories really shows that they felt that they were important to them and they wanted to be even more closely linked with the characters in those stories, the divinities, the gods or the heroes, children of gods in most cases. And then later, these stories were even written down by historians. Now, history, by its very definition, is a listing of events which have occurred. And of course, these stories have passed into myth, and most of them contain divinities and heroes that sound far too exciting and supernatural to be real. Now, these historians, they did acknowledge that there were different versions of each of these stories and no one really necessarily knew if they were true. But the fact that they chose to include them in their histories does suggest their importance overall. Now, when you go on to the Roman side of this unit, which you'll do in September um, with uh, your new teacher or if you're online here, I don't know. You might be doing it at any point. Um, You'll find that the stories that you're reading for the Rome side of things do actually come up in from fact the historical texts well, written by actual historians, people who believe themselves as historians, not as mythographers. Our first Greek story is the naming of Athens. Now, it doesn't literally give us the story of the founding of Athens, but it's part of the founding of Athens. So this is seen on the west pediment of the Parthenon, as you can see in the, the small image there, just a section of it. And we have our two main characters, um, uh, Athene and Poseidon. And the story goes that the founder of Athens, King Cecrops, wanted one of the gods that they worshipped in Athens to patronise his city in Attica, meaning to look after it, to be its patron. Um, a very active relationship. You get our worship and we get your protection. He held a competition. The best gift from the two main gods they worshipped there, Athene and Poseidon, would earn the patronage. So, Interestingly, a human, well, okay, he's not actually a human, as you can see from the picture uh, coming up uh, now. Um, Seacrops is kind of half snake. Yeah. Anyway, um, so he holds his competition. He's, well, again, I can't call him mortal. He's half snake. It's, it's, it's a weird situation. But in any case, he's making the gods earn this patronage, which is certainly quite an interesting stance. Um, he's not saying, you know, we beg you, Athene. He's saying, right, Athene Poseidon. What have you got? So Poseidon struck the ground with his trident and a seawater spring gushed forth, 
on one hand they thought yeah a spring and this was on top of the acropolis you know it's pretty impressive there's a spring on top of the acropolis it's a big slab of rock in the middle of the city but it's seawater so it's not actually that practical you can't really drink seawater it's salty and you can see in the comic image in the middle there, a little spring popping up there now you could see this metaphorically the spring gushing forth where no spring had gushed before could suggest uh sort of the idea of being plentiful and the fact that it's sea water does represent perhaps their prowess at sea warfare for example or in harvesting the sea uh, and gaining fish from it generally though a, a spring is for drinking and so a spring of seawater not necessarily is usable when we look at athene's gift she plants an olive tree which legend has it was still there and in fact uh was uh, had the arechtheum another uh, temple on the uh, acropolis built around it to keep it there was it really the same one? Well, anyway, there was definitely a great big oak, uh, sorry, great big um, uh, olive tree there. And this olive tree is very much in keeping with what Athens was famous for, which is what is its ingenuity. Because from um, an olive tree, you can get so much. As Seacrops is saying in the image here, olives, olive oil, oil lamps, wood, cooking, cleaning. You can do a lot with that, as well as you can use the wood to make many many other things too so this metaphorical version of this gift too is very in keeping with Athens and so Athene's gift was deemed more appropriate by both Zeus who was helping Cecrops uh, vote on who would win and Cecrops himself so going back to the original image from the west pediment of the Parthenon or this recreation here you can just see uh, Poseidon in his what do you got stance he has got his trident which probably would have been made of metal just between his legs underneath there you can see the um, the, the spring gushing forth um, but behind Athene and probably quite tellingly right in the middle of the pediment you can see the fully grown olive tree and so while they both make this lovely V shape with their weapons here, so they're holding, it does kind of guide your eye in and down and into the middle of the image. You can really see the olive tree and it reminds us who did win that story, even though Athene and Poseidon on the pediment seem to be placed in an equal position, the tree being in the middle shows who won. The second story that we study for this unit is going to take slightly more time than that first story, which is quite small and neat. This is the story of Theseus's labours. Theseus, his six labours, some of the other labour-like um, adventures he went on. And we're going to learn about the Kilix or drinking cup on which his main six labours are listed pictorially. So first of all, we really need to know a lot more about Theseus before we get to know what he did on his labour. So we're actually going to start off with who he was and why he's important to Athens, which takes most of the story to tell. Now, in my notepad for my students, I've got several of the comics that I've previously drawn about the life of Theseus. And there's a link below the video if you want to see those for yourself. So Theseus's birth is an interesting story. He's actually the son of Aegeus a king of Athens. Aegeus is not a snaky king like Cecrops. There's another story about how uh, Cecrops's family gets replaced by this Aegis family. And in fact, there's also more stories about how the families uh, sort of kick each other out and so forth. And Aegis has, has taken back over. And you'd think, well, that's easy enough. He's the son of a king. He's a prince easy but it's not because all great heroes actually have to have a much more complex origin story think about the story of of hercules's birth heracles's birth that you learned in the previous unit so first of all uh Aegeus, king of Athens, had been to Delphi in order to visit the oracle because he hadn't had an heir. And he's asking how to get one. Um, birds and the bees there, Aegeus. But no, he wants to make sure because unfortunately this time your heir is male. He wants to make sure he has a male child. And going to the oracle at Delphi or getting an oracle from Delphi is something that was generally quite traditionally done if you were uh, an important person and you needed to ask a good question. 
Uh, this uh, bottom of another Kilix, not the one that we're going to be learning about, this one by the Codros painter is probably one of the most famous images of the Oracle of Delphi. Uh, the oracles were the female priests of Apollo, which is normally quite, uh, you normally have a male priest for a male god, but these were quite special. These women lived almost like nuns and they would be sitting on a tripod apparently over a crack in the ground from which the vapours of the dead body of the python killed by Apollo to whom the shrine was sacred came up and made them able to tell the future. It made them able to be apparently entered by Apollo, the god of prophecy, one of his many talents, and and then you'd you'd find out from them a mysterious message and you'd have to interpret it. And he didn't understand the message, Didija, so he stopped off with King Piteus uh, of Troizen to try and get an answer for this riddling oracle. And the riddling oracle he was given was this. Do not loosen the bulging mouth of the wineskin until you have reached the height of Athens, lest you die of grief. Hmm. Now, that is a metaphorical riddle. Lots of riddles are very metaphorical. It does not literally mean don't open a wineskin, which is full, uh, until you get to the height of Athens, which sounds like the Acropolis, in case you later on die of sadness. Well, it's definitely a warning. But what on earth could the loosening, the bulging mouth of the wineskin possibly mean now he did stop off with king piteous of troison and king piteous actually did realize what the oracle meant a very rude metaphor about not doing a certain act until you got home but he didn't tell aegis what indeed instead was to get him drunk and introduce him to his own daughter ethra now the drunken aegis slept with ethra and Aethra immediately conceived a child. Now, apparently, the story goes that Aethra also received a message that same night in a dream, and apparently from Athene, goddess of wisdom. And the message was, you need to immediately now wade out to the island of Sphyria off the coast, because it's very important you do this. So, of course, Giving great credence to dreams is something the Greeks did. And so Aethra does wade out to the island of Sphyria and she there meets Poseidon and they apparently also conceive a child. Now, unlike the Heracles situation where there are two babies being conceived uh, in a heteropaternal superfecundity situation and there are twins, this is the same baby. So somehow this baby, which will become Theseus, is both part Aegeus's child and part Poseidon's child. So he's able to say in future, I am the child of Poseidon. Basically, he has both mortal and immortal features. Now, we know already that this is one of the things that can make you a hero, having a divine birth. He's already got um, the patron, sorry, the, 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 he's already got a famous father, who is very wealthy and is highborn in the king of Athens. But having Poseidon on the side too, that might well protect him in future. So I wouldn't be surprised if this story was made up to add to his grandeur and keep him safe because Aegeus, worried that the news of him having a baby, whom he figured was probably going to be an heir, seeing as that's you know what he had gone to Delphi to find out about, he thought that might cause unrest in Athens, right? He and his family had seized the throne back and he didn't necessarily want people uh, maybe attacking this child to get rid of his heir. So he left the boy in Troizen until he came of age. Yes, he basically abandons his kid for reasons that he thinks are the right reasons. And he takes his sandals and his sword and he puts them under a massive rock. And he tells Aethra that when the boy comes of age, go and show him the rock. If he can lift the rock and take my sandals and my sword, he can come to Athens and claim his birthright as my son. So it does sound a little bit like the whole sword in the stone that we have in, in England. The story of King Arthur, the rightful person, will be able to draw the sword from the stone and that sword will be the indicator that they will be king. This is a very similar situation. When 
a young man turns up in Athens wearing sandals that he recognises and a sword that is definitely his, that is how Aegeus will know that this is his son. And he will be able to surprise everyone with the news that he's his son and he will have kept his son safe all this time. So Theseus does come of age and he travels to Athens. So here's the story of that. When he was old enough, Aethra did, as Aegeus had told her, and showed her son Theseus the rock. And of course, because he is the rightful heir, he lifted that rock and he found the sandals and sword of his father Aegeus. Aethra told him now was the time to go to Athens. With these objects, he would become king. As you can see in the comic there, his feet and his sword seem to be bright and shiny. Uh, and that's what's going to help the king recognise a son he has never met. So Theseus has an option here. He could just sail to Athens. That would be the easy route. Sailing was a far easier option than walking back in these times, because at least when you were at sea, you knew where you were going. And you were relatively safe as long as you sailed at the right time of year. Whereas if you took an inland route, there was no police service. There were no hotels to stay at. You would have to rely on the kindness of strangers obeying Xenia or the laws of hospitality laid down by Zeus. And you'd have to hope that there were no bandits on the way to, to kill you and take what you had. So people often sailed. Now, Theseus wants to take the more difficult route because who is he right now? He's just a guy with some old sandals and a sword. He's got no reputation. And that's something else you need as a hero. You need that reputation. It's not enough to be son of the king and maybe Poseidon's your father, you need to prove it through your actions. Also, how cool would it be if when he arrived in Athens, everyone already knew who he was? So he decided to walk and thus build his reputation on the way by getting rid of any monsters or bandits or any bad person that he could find and rid the world of dangers. Kind of like Heracles. And the journey was, in fact, full of monsters and evildoers that apparently had been missed by Heracles when he was off doing his 12 labours. And they were just ready to be dealt with. How perfect a situation. So this is exactly what Theseus did. So as we will find out in the next few slides, he does six official labours. There are six people he gets rid of to rid the world of these menaces. And he does some other labours too, but these six are the most important. Um, and we will then see the others that he does by when he gets to Athens, because of course there's a very famous story coming up, which I'm sure most of you are dying to get to. So, Theseus's labours. You can learn more about, as I said already, Theseus's entire life in the comic, which I have put the part one of in my student pack. Yes, that's the labyrinth at the bottom there, guys. The links are there below the videos if you want to read further. Uh, we're now going to cover these six labours in more detail, which I don't go into detail of on this particular comic because this focuses on the later labours, of which there are two quite important ones. So, there are six labours. Uh, now, on the pack that I've given my students, you've got a chance to jot down some general details about them in the table. And then all the ones that are listed on the Killix have got a page of their own for you to go through in detail, making notes from the slides about the story and what is pictured on the Killix itself. You need to be able to recognise each of the labours on the Killix, just like you learned how to recognise each of Heracles's 12 labours on the Metopes at the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. So I will go through them now to show you how to pronounce them. One is Periphetes, two is Sinis, three is the Cromionian sow, and a sow is a very large female pig, four is Skyron, Five is Kirkion and six is Procrustes. And I did include an, um, a, a separate different type of spelling for Kirkion and five. But to be honest, you could also do the same with Skyron. It would be, it would be SK rather and, and so forth. Um, as long as you're able to recognise these names and which labour they were, you'll be on the right track. His other two labours, although they're not part of the six official ones, are the Marathonian Bull 
and the Minotaur. Now, not all six of the official labours that I've numbered there are on the Kilix, but the Kilix has got the other five and the Marathonian Bull and the Minotaur, which is why we're going to learn about them. Plus, they give us a much fuller understanding of Theseus's character. Now, most of Theseus's labours were to remove inland threats to other travellers. These bandits and monsters can also be seen as being impious. They are basically not pious. They are acting in the incorrect way. And the laws that they are breaking, specifically here, the law of Xenia, the law of hospitality, the idea that you must give hospitality to anyone you come across, lest they be a god in disguise, that's Theo Xenia, and Zeus protects these laws. Because they're not doing that, they are in breach of these laws. And really, Theseus can be seen as an agent of Zeus, an immortal agent of Zeus, who is going to punish all of these people on Zeus's behalf. It's a bit like in the Odyssey that you'll read in the Homeric World unit next year, where Odysseus is there to punish people who also don't do Xenia correctly, like the suitors cramming into his house and Polyphemus, the Cyclops, who, instead of giving hospitality to his men, um, eats Odysseus's men. That's kind of the wrong thing to do. And uh, he doesn't come out of that very well. Odysseus does punish him on Zeus's behalf. Here is a little comic strip that explains what Xenia is. It is an ancient ritual of guest friendship. So as a guest, you have the ability to ask for hospitality from anyone. But you do have to make sure you are not a burden on the host by overstaying your welcome. So you can't just turn up and basically say you're just going to live off someone for ages. You can expect to be given hospitality for a day or two before you are sent on your way. Now, as a host, you have to, sorry, as a host, you have to provide food, drink, comfort, so a bath, a bed, and protection to your guest who's walked in from anywhere. You must not ask them their name or their business until you have provided all of these things because that's just rude. Plus, it you know, the idea is you should be able to do this for anyone. It doesn't matter who there are. And it's kind of cheating if you ask who they are first, because if you find out they're just some beggar, you might decide not to give them. And that, 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 that would be breaking Xenia. And, you know, they could be a god in disguise anyway. So at the end of this period of Xenia, you both exchange guest gifts. Now, these are basically worthy presents that link a guest and a host's family forever. And I seriously mean forever. You give the best of what you have. It might be some kind of object. In the Odyssey, we get some good examples. Um, Odysseus's bow, for example, was a guest gift given to um, a member of his family. Um, and in the Iliad, we see some amazing examples of this where um, heroes on the battlefield recognise each other, kind of, even though one's on the Trojan side and one's on the Greek side. And they go, wait, my dad knew your dad. Yeah, this thing I'm using right now to fight you with, this is from him. Wow, we're friends forever. We will never fight. And then they go off and just fight other people. Even though they're on opposing sides, the xenia, the guest friendship of their ancestors is so strong, it actually stops them from being able to fight each other because they're bound by Xenia. So you start to get the idea that Xenia is a massive deal. And also, when you put it into practice, how practical is it? If you are walking across Greece and there are no hotels at this point, you need to be able to rely on the kindness of strangers to look after you overnight, to keep you from the bad people. And they need to trust that you are not going to attack them in your sleep and steal what they have after they've given this. So it does work both ways. It's both religious and practical. Let's find out now about these labours. Uh, the kilix that you can see here, this large drinking bowl that would have been full of wine. And as you drank from the lip of it, you would see more and more of the pictures revealed. This is currently in the British Museum. So this is my photograph of when I went to visit it a few years ago. It's from around 440, 430 BC. And it's apparently painted by the Codrus painter. Uh, some of his works have been identified and, and named as being from this particular chap. So this is a, a picture of it just to give you an idea. 
Um, here you can see the official photograph of it from the British Museum website. And what we've got is right in the middle, and I know it looks really flat right now, but remember this is a, a bowl, it is concave. In the middle at the bottom is a central design with a frieze around it. And then uh, the, the frieze of patterns is around that is another frieze of images which represent six of the labours of Theseus. Now, just like the Metopes of Heracles, they're not in the right order and they're not all the official six labours. So we're going to look at each one now in detail. So as I said, in your note pack, you will find a page for each one of the images that you can see dotted around. There is also another page with this image on it that I want you to come back to later once you've learned about each of these individual um, images and label them so you can have a quick reminder. Be careful. Think about which way up that picture is and label them very, very carefully. Now, the first of Theseus's labours isn't actually on the Gillix at all. So um, you're just going to add some details in that table, that very first table I gave you. Um, basically, his first one is Periphetes, sometimes known as Corinites, which is a bit annoying, um, sometimes known as the club bearer, because this is how he gets his club. What's that you say? Didn't Heracles have a club? Yeah, uh -huh. how do you think we're linking these guys together here? Now, Periphetes because you, when you have an enemy, you kind of want your enemy to be a really cool enemy so that you are even cooler when you defeat them. He was apparently son of Hephaestus and a woman called Anticlea. Hephaestus, of course, being the god of craft. So he's got a god as his father. He was apparently lame in one leg and had one eye like a cyclops. Um, he roamed the road from Athens to Troizen, where he robbed travellers and killed them with a blow from his bronze club. Probably the idea of him being a son of Hephaestus, you know, the craftsman, was because of the bronze club, which he probably claimed came from Hephaestus. Theseus encountered him first and killed him near Epidauros, and he took his club as a trophy and used that in subsequent labours. Now, I haven't drawn a comic for this one, so I found this one on the internet, which I thought was really cute. Um, uh, yeah. I think I think that big thing that looks like a sack is meant to be the club. I don't know who drew this. I can't find a name. If anyone does find out, I'd love to give credit to this adorable artist here. So looking at this story, um, we start to realise that there's some similarities here between him and, and Heracles, for example. So we also find out that just because you're a son of a god doesn't make you good. All right. So, you know, you can be a child of a god and have a bad reputation. Um, it does, however, make you, as I said, a good opponent, though, as you are high status or you have godlike characteristics. The fact that he was lame in one leg and had one eye like a cyclops, it makes him kind of other and therefore monstrous. Now, that's not a very politically correct opinion, but the idea is he's a bit like a monster. What really makes him monstrous, though, is this, the fact that he killed and rob well, robbed and killed. You rob them first, then kill them. Well, actually, it'd probably be easier to rob them after you kill them. Anyway, he took the goods of, without Xenia, and he took the lives of, definitely not good Xenia, people he met. They had no connection to him. This is bad Xenia. Zeus will punish him. And that's what makes him monstrous. He's not acting in the correct way. And the fact that Theseus encounters him and kills him, takes his club, uses it in the labours, that makes him like Heracles. So it's kind of a way, really, of linking a Theseus and Heracles by this imagery of the club. Now, on the table, I haven't given you very much uh, space to jot this down. If you want to make more notes on this, please do uh, just find another piece of paper, maybe, and make, make your own design that would have gone on the Killix had the Codrus painter decided that he wanted this one to go on there. Have a think about why he didn't put, or she, we don't know who the Codrus painter was, why the Codrus painter did not paint this one on that Killix. Do have a think about that. Now, the rest of the labours are on the Killix, so let's look at the next one. Labour two, Sinis. Now, just to introduce you to how each of these slides is going to work, I have put the story in white on the slide. I've tried to keep it nice and simple so you can jot it down and turn it into even more simple uh, bullet points. And then on somewhere on here, normally on the left, 
I have taken the commentary, the uh, the commentary written by uh, one of the curators at the British Museum. I've just written BM for short here and I've put it on here. I have included a link to the page where you can see all the commentaries on the official British Museum website. So I've just put it here individually because there's quite a lot of information on that website and I want you to be able to see it separately. But I highly recommend going and actually looking at the British Museum website too. So the story of Sinis, an Isthmian outlaw. So the Isthmus is that little bit of land that connects the Peloponnese to mainland Greece. I think I've talked to my class about it before because you were able to bring your ship across there on rollers uh, and get it to the other side without having to sail all, around, all the way around Greece. Uh, so Sinus would force travellers to help him bend pine trees to the ground and then he would unexpectedly let go, catapulting his victims through the air to their deaths. Yeah, death by pine tree. Now, there's a slightly gorier version of this story where he actually he makes them uh, bend the pine trees down to the ground and then ties them to two separate pine trees that have been bent in different directions and then let's go and the trees go in different directions and tear the victim in two. Either way, he's killing people in a really inventive and bizarre and thus, frankly, quite evil way. So this led him to being calling, uh, this led to him being called Pytocamptes, which means pine bender. So Sinus Pytocamptes, or Sinus the pine bender, is the name that he was known by. Now, clearly, this guy is a menace. Um, how he forced travellers to do this, we don't know, especially as all the men on the Killix who are painted here are naked. <laughs> Not entirely sure why. It must have been really, really hot that summer. Um, so on the BM commentary, which goes through the details here, we have Sinus Pitocampides seated on a hilltop beside a tall pine tree. And he is dragged to the left by Theseus, who has seized him by the right arm in one hand and with the other hand pulls down or draws down the top of the pine tree like he's about to attach Sinus to it. Sinus has thrown one arm around the pine tree as if to pull away from Theseus and his foot presses against the rock, which is actually from the, the next scene because all these um, images are painted next to each other. It kind of makes it look like they're all happening at the same time, but it is in fact the next scene. Uh, with his left foot, he struggles to rise. So he's, he's trying to push off and pull away from Theseus at the same time. Um, at the foot of the hill, you can see the outline of a tortoise. Now, it hasn't been finished. And in fact, that's from a different story. This image is so similar to another image that the artist made a mistake. And there's a tortoise in the other story, or possibly a turtle, um, which is quite important. Yes, it's a man-eating turtle. Of course it is. Um, and he's, like, he's gone, oh, no, I've... I've I've messed up. I've not. I'm just going to leave it and hope no one notices. That's what the quadrus painter has done. And then what you can see behind the hill is the legs of the sow, which is in the next picture, the Cromionian sow. So with my um, delightful red, I think on the next slide I did it in yellow because it's not very visible in red. Uh, my annotations here that I did in class with my previous class, we've got thesis on the left. And in his hand, you can see him holding the pine. And in his other hand, he's holding on to Sinus. I will point out now, because you'll see this in all of them, that Theseus has got traditional, neat and tidy Athenian hair with a band. He's also unbearded, showing he is youthful. And he's got his sword in a scabbard hanging from a belt across his chest. And he's naked because... um. They often painted men naked to show off their bodies. On the right, Sinus looks comparatively very rough and unkempt. He's balding. His hair is long and matted into kind of almost like uh, uh, like dreads. Uh, he's got a big bushy beard. To an Athenian drinking from this cup, Sinus would look like a barbarian. And that's how we know he's the monstrous character. He's the one doing the wrong thing. He doesn't look like a nice civilised Athenian character. He's trying to pull away. We can see the pine tree. I know it doesn't look like a pine tree. Again, just don't worry about it. And we can see the hill. And just below the arrow pointing at hill, you can see that interesting outline, which is meant to be uh, the shell of a turtle or tortoise that the artist has accidentally 
done. Now, when we see the one where he's properly or she has properly done it, you'll be able to see the difference. All right. So think about the images here that tell us that this is definitely Labour 2, Sinus Peter Campti's the pine bender. You've got this man who looks very unkempt. That's not going to help you because there's lots of those. But what you do have is the tree. All right. So the tree is your main image here that you should focus on. Please try and make sure that you make uh, as many annotations as you can, similar to what's on here. And you can take the details from the BM commentary as well to add to your own annotations. Let's look at Labour 3. So Labour 3 was the Sow of Chromion. And as you can immediately see in the image, that's definitely a female pig, right? Yeah. There's also a woman in the image and the way that the pig is in front of the woman and they're actually in a very similar position with their arms raised could well be a nod to the idea that it might not have literally been a pig. It might actually have been a female bandit, which is quite an exciting idea. So the story goes is, uh, sorry, the story goes that the Cromionian sow was a wild pig not a boar this time, but a pig that ravaged the region around the village of Cromion between Megara and Corinth. It was said to, by some to be the daughter offspring of Echidna and Typhon, which were amazing monsters in early Greek mythology. That's how bad this pig was, right? Um, and was named after the woman who raised it, Fire, the Grey One. Now, we've got a, a female image there with, with white hair. That might be Fire, the Grey One. And the sow was also said to be the mother of the Caledonian boar. And we know the Caledonian boar from, from previous stories was also a, a massive pig with tusks that ravaged the countryside and killed people. So we're linking these monstrous creatures together. Uh, Plutarch, the historian, well, actually the biographer, states that he had also heard Fire herself was actually a murderous female robber and was given the nickname the Sow, meaning the female pig, because of her uncouth manners. Well, you know, she does go around killing people. That's pretty uncouth. And so it's actually a metaphor. She's not really a Sow, but over time, because her nickname was Sow, it gets turned into a real Sow over in, in the stories, the way the stories are told, passed down by word of mouth. So um, here are some annotations. We've got fire or the sow on the left. We can see the sow is attacking. Look at its, its little piggy uh, feet raised up as if it's rushing at Theseus. And then we've got Theseus on the other side here. And he's facing away from us with his sword in his hand and a cloak over his arm or a cheat on his mantle. It rather looks a bit like he is a Toreador from Spain, doesn't it? And he is using the fabric to tempt the pig. And then as the pig runs at the fabric, perhaps like the bull is tempted by the rag. Bulls are colourblind. They can't see that the rag is red, but they go for the floating stuff. He might then stab the sword. Sorry, stab with the sword. So that's possibly what he's doing in this image. In the commentary, it tells us that the Sow of Cromion springs upward to the right against Theseus, uh, who advances with his sword drawn back and left hand raised and wrapped in a mantle as a shield. So he might be using that to fend him off, or as I think, he's being like a Toreador, he's attracting it so he can kill it. Beside the Sow, in the background, an old woman stands, bending forward with both arms outstretched towards Theseus, the left resting on a long staff with a forefinger extended, as if she's pointing at him. A mass, uh, sorry, a long cheat on, a long dress and a mass of white hair. Her face is wrinkled and the flesh of her arms is covered with strokes, indicating that she is also hairy. You know, so she's been made to look for a woman at this time, kind of ugly and old. So she is probably Cromion, the personification or wood nymph of the locality is one way of seeing it. Or she's Phi-Eye, uh, the grey one, or she could well be the manifestation of the actual female robber who was called the Sow. So please make your notes and annotations on your sheet. And let's look at Labour 4. Labour 4 is Skyron. Now, it looks like almost an unfair fight here with Theseus on the left holding something that looks a bit like a club. But when you look closer, it's actually not a club. It's like a massive killix, a really, really wide one. But it's not for drinking out of. Again, you'll see that this male character he's fighting 
looks just like the male character he was fighting in the first of the labours to be pictured here but it's a different guy and now i think you'll notice the turtle this is the one which has the real turtle in it don't be distracted by the tree that's also there because they're not bending the tree down so look at the images and the symbols here that might be useful to tell you that this is the story of Skyron, who robbed travellers passing the Skyronian rocks. And so he's possibly named after these rocks. He made it his practice to force travellers to wash his feet. Now, this is something you would do for your guests. So being forced to do that for someone else for a start, that's going against Xenia. And he would be sitting at the edge of a cliff while you did this, and then, well, when they, uh, the travellers knelt down in front of him to wash his feet in his podonipter, his large foot basin, which is what Theseus is holding, he would give them a vicious kick over the cliff into the sea, where the victim's body would then be eaten by a huge, monstrous sea turtle, which used to swim under the rocks or rolled down the crags into the sea at a place called Chalone, which actually means the tortoise. So we don't really know whether this tortoise or turtle was a real part of this myth or whether, again, it came of the name of the area. But then again, the area could well have been named after it. So we don't entirely know. And yes, I know that turtle doesn't look like it could possibly devour anyone, but you just have to take it for granted. Um, Yeah, it's a man-eating turtle. OK, guys. So uh, as we can see here. We've got Theseus and we've got Skyron, who is actually falling backwards away. He's so desperate to get away from Theseus, who's about to wallop him with his own footpan. And again, he's got very unkempt, barbaric looking hair. Uh, the tree is not important, OK? Um, and he's about to fall into the sea. He's going to go over the rock, the cliff, and he's going to be eaten by his own turtle. So to read through the, the British Museum uh, commentary, uh, he was either the son of Pelops or Poseidon, let's just say all oh, my bad, sorry, and was a famous Corinthian bandit who haunted the frontier between Attica and Megaris. Theseus on the left and three quarter back view swings over his head to the footpan, the podonipter, to strike down Skyron, who has fallen backwards to the right on the hill in an attitude balancing that of Procrustes in Labour 3. Uh, in image three. He is bald over the forehead and has shaggy hair and a beard, just like uh, Procrustes. Um, on the summit of the hill beside Skyron is a willow tree, possibly, which is not important. And at the foot is the tortoise, half seen as though climbing up out of the water. So you can kind of see how the artist might have got going on the pot one day and then realised, oh no, I've started painting the wrong aspect of the character and I've started doing the turtle. I'll leave it and move on. Um, they are really, really similar. So what we need to look out for, the symbols that tell us that this is Skyron, is really the turtle fully done and the foot pan that Theseus was about to pretend to wash Skyron's feet in. Labour five is Kirkion. And here we can see this is getting up close and personal with Kirkion in what is clearly a wrestling hold. The um, the sword and the sheath still seems to be in the sheath. But on the right hand side, we can also see that a club seems to be hanging on a wall unused. So they are instead actually wrestling. And this was a form of combat. So Kirkion was in fact meant to have been a notorious king of Eleusis, a place near Athens. So we can see that uh, uh, Theseus is getting close to Athens at this point. And he was famous for his cruelty towards his own family and towards strangers and travellers, basically anyone. And when he picked a fight with them and they refused to fight him, um, he would kill them. And if they did agree to fight him, uh, basically wrestling, he promised to give the other person his kingdom if they won. And that was the way that they would agree to do it. However, the loser was always the person he challenged because he cheated and he murdered them. He was also famous for being extremely strong, which is another reason why maybe he always won. And possibly the son of Poseidon or Hephaestus, because, you know, why not at this stage? Other writers identified Kirkion as a robber who operated around Eleusis, not actually the evil king of Eleusis. But still, he's certainly someone to be reckoned with. However, Theseus, as we know, is clearly the good guy, so he's got to win. He beats and kills Kirkion. He lifted him up and dashed him to the ground. Some people actually suggest that that is how wrestling was invented. But, you know, they were certainly doing some kind of fighting. In fact, there are an awful lot of stories about how wrestling was invented in Greece, and this is just one of them. 
Um, here are some useful annotations. We've got Theseus is on the left. Kirkion, you'll notice, he does look a bit different and that his hair is thinning and he, he does have a beard. But his hair is a lot more neat and tidy, as is his beard. And he's wearing this apparently very slightly more civilised headband, which is possibly what makes him out to be not as awful as one of the bandits, but actually maybe a high-born enemy. Uh, on the BM commentary, it tells us that Kirkion's image here has Theseus on the left, who has gripped with his right hand the left arm and with his left hand the right side of his opponent. I've gone over the arms in here so you can see them nice and clearly in the annotation. And he throws Kirkion backwards across his thighs. If you look at their tangle of legs there, you can see that he's basically about to use his own legs to knock Kirkion over. The left arm of Kirkion hangs uselessly behind the back of Theseus. See the way he's grabbed his elbow, he's not able, Kirkion's not able to move his own arm. And with his right, he vainly tries to loosen Theseus's grasp of his side. So you can see his hand disappearing around his body, possibly trying to push Theseus's arm as way. So Theseus is clearly in the stronger position overall. So he has a short beard and hair and a fillet and is bald over the forehead. So he's older, but he's not necessarily uh, a barbarian, although he's still acting in a barbarian way. And beside this group, a club hanging up and a spear on the staff resting on end obliquely against the background. They tell us that this was a physical fight, not a feat of strength using weapons. So our clues here are probably going to be the fact that Kirkion's hair is different to the other bandits and so making him out to be a different character and the wrestling position, because in the end, that's the main part of the story of Kirkion. He challenges people to a wrestling match and then kills them. Our final of the official six labours is Procrustes. This is my favourite one, not just because his name sounds like the word crusty, which is kind of how he looks in this image, but because of what he's sitting on, a bed. Now, Procrustes was apparently a son of Poseidon. You'll get to know that Poseidon has a lot of very disagreeable sons, right? He was a rogue smith. I don't know how you can be a rogue smith. I think the idea is, right, you're a smith, but you don't do stuff for people. A smith is someone who uses metalwork and produces metal objects, but he clearly does it not for profit, but to hurt people. So he's a rogue smith and a bandit from Attica. So we're almost at Athens now, who attacked people by pretending to give them Xenia in his house. So he tricks people into his home and he gives them a bed to sleep on and they lie on the bed. But if they're too short for the bed, he insists on stretching them until they fit it. And that obviously is going to kill them. It's basically like being on a rack. And if they're too long for the bed, he springs up and cuts off their legs with an axe. Wow. That's an evil man. So the bed is meant to be made of iron. So he basically gets people, says, here's a bed, they lie on it. He quickly somehow ties them to it and he uses it as a torture device. That really goes against Senya. Theseus fitted Procrustes to his own bed, as you can see is happening in this image. And I kind of like Procrustes kind of going, oh, come on, I can't believe I fell for that. While Theseus has grabbed Crusty's his own axe and is about to hack his limbs off. Nice. Um, that sword hasn't really been used an awful lot except for the Cromionian sow and we haven't really seen that club either. Maybe that's why the very first uh, label was left off because the club isn't really that important. Anyway, let's look at the BM commentary here and the annotations I've made. So we can see very clearly Procrustes, he's unkempt. We see now that that means that he's a bad guy. We've seen that in most of the other images of the bandits here. Long hair, big beard. Whereas uh, Theseus has his delightful Athenian hair. Procrustes has fallen backwards to the left on his bed, supporting himself with his right hand and with his left hand and foot feebly raised as if to say, no, please don't kill me and trying to push Theseus away. Uh, he tries to ward off the blow with which Theseus, swinging over his back, is about to deal with a double axe, a palikis. Um, Procrustes has rough shaggy hair and a beard and the bed is marked off in two lengths by curved strokes of 
brown or black slip. Um, so yeah, it's almost like the bed is a measuring device and he's going to stretch people to it or cut them off at the bit that doesn't fit. So clearly here, the symbol that we're going to be looking out for to help us identify this picture is that iron bed and that axe that Theseus is swinging. So why do we think the artist chose to put specific tasks that he did put or she did put on that kilix? Have a think. What is important about each of the labours that have been shown? Do they link to Heracles in some way and how? Could this be important if the answer is yes? Why not include labour one? And what else is included? So we are going to have two more stories that we haven't actually covered yet, and they both have bulls in them. So write yourself an answer to this question. Why do you think the artist chose to put those specific tasks on the Kilix? Now let's look at the other two labours. First of all, the Marathonian bull. In the little comic, it's, it's uh, mentioned right here, the Marathonian bull. Um, because it takes part in quite a few different stories. And later on, Theseus is sent against it uh, in order to try and kill it. And the person who sends him against it is trying to kill him. So it's a bit like a Eurystheus and Heracles situation. Here is the image on the Kilix that we've been studying that shows the Marathonian bull. Now, this is not one of his labours on the way to Athens. He's now got to Athens and he has discovered himself to his father Aegeus, who has recognised the sandals and has recognised the sword. But Aegeus is now married to Medea, a powerful sorceress. And she doesn't want any random heir suddenly turning up, ruining her chances of running the kingdom by using Aegeus to do so. So she suggests to Aegeus, and possibly using her magic, she manages to convince him to do this, to make Theseus prove himself by going off and killing the fearsome Marathonian bull that has been ruining the countryside around hereabouts. Media put him up to fighting it, hoping that Theseus would die because everyone else had blooming well died trying to go up. But however, he didn't die and came back victorious, having defeated the Marathonian bull. Um, she then, Medea, tries to poison Theseus to get him out of the way, and that doesn't work. And she flees in very excitingly a chariot pulled by dragons. All right, Medea is an awesome character. There's an entire Greek tragedy about her. I'd highly recommend you find it and read it. But she flees, leading Theseus there to be recognised as the heir of Aegeus. So in the image we've got here, this in yellow is from the BM commentary. The Marathonian bull charging violently to the right is checked by Theseus, who with his right leg supported against a rock and left knee uh, pressed against the bull's shoulder, throws his weight back with a cord in his left hand, which is fastened to the animal's horns. Now you can't really see, but there is meant to be a cord there that is attached to the animal's horns. And he throws it back on its haunches. So the animals run past him. It's like he's lassoed its horns and he's pulling it back and the animal's going, Whoa, oh, what's this? And he's catching it. Now we've got the club. What image does this remind you of, perhaps? Could it possibly be an image of Heracles doing almost exactly the same thing to the Cretan bull? Interestingly enough, the Marathonian bull is the Cretan bull. If you recall... Heracles, when he caught the Cretan bull, he held it in a headlock, kept it um, unable to breathe until he had dominated it. And then he led it back to show King Eurystheus. And then he let it go. And it wandered off to Marathon, which is the place that uh, is outside of Athens that originally uh, is the reason why we have a marathon race of a certain distance. It's the distance between Marathon and Athens. You can look up that story. I won't go into it now. So this is meant to be the same bull as Heracles fought. It's just now become a bull of a different area, Marathon, instead. So that's probably why Theseus here has a club. This is a clear indication of him being a great hero, just like Hercules or Heracles. 
The second of the other two labours is the one he is most famous for, the Minotaur, which he starts going off to after he has become officially Prince of Athens. Now, Aegeus has earlier on upset King Minos of Greece, but not directly. King Minos of Crete, the Minoan king, his son Androgeos had gone to mainland Greece and taken part in the Pan-Athenaic Games. And apparently he'd won everything. I'm not sure how he did that, seeing as he wasn't actually an Athenian. And some of those were definitely tribal games. But anyway, he won a lot of stuff. And the Athenians apparently were very envious that he'd turned up and put them all to shame. So he was either killed on his way to more games in Thebes by jealous rivals, or it is said, King Aegeus said, if you're so great, go and kill the Marathonian bull. And the Marathonian bull then killed him. Either way, Androgeos did not come home and King Minos of Crete held Athens directly responsible for the death of his son. Now, Athens was not necessarily the greatest power in Greece at this point, and Minos apparently had a fierce navy, and he basically held Athens to ransom. He said, we will wage war on you unless you provide me with a tribute. And yes, we're getting Hunger Games territory here. This is part of the same story. Uh, a tribute every, uh, every year of seven youths and seven maidens. Sometimes that story is it's seven youths and seven maidens every nine years. Sometimes that story is it's nine youths and nine maidens every seven years. The numbers are picky. But in any case, by giving seven of your young women ready to have babies and seven of your young men ready to fight for your country you are really disabling yourself and it's a power play Minos is saying give me your youths they're not coming back we own you so they are apparently being fed to the minotaur in the labyrinth under the uh, Knossos palace and so Theseus decides that's not good enough. Theseus is most well known for travelling to Knossos on Crete, pretending to be one of the Athenian tributes to be fed to the Minotaur on the orders of King Manos. And while he's there, he seduces the princess Ariadne into helping him get in and out of the labyrinth and killing the Minotaur before escaping. And this image, which I playfully created, uh, shows him telling Minos uh, that he's one of the tributes whilst in the actual, although it's very much rebuilt and reimagined, throne room at Knossos that you can still visit today. This comic excerpt, which is in your pack, my students, and on the website if you want to look at everyone else, shows the way Thesis was again tested on arrival in Knossos. On arrival on Crete, Minos surveyed the tribute and selected one to, you know, try out. Let's see what they're made of. Theseus told Minos... As the son of Poseidon, he must protect the virgins from tyrants like you. And, well, you're the son of Poseidon, are you? Fine. Minos throws his ring into the sea and says, go get it. If your father is really the king of the sea, he will help you. Theseus takes on the challenge and wins. The Nereids, uh, daughters of the sea, including Thetis, the mother of Achilles, help him find the ring and breathe underwater. And he manages to impress uh, uh, press, um, Minos further. So that's another one of additional little stories about Theseus that, again, adds to his heroic nature. The stories of his heroism being helped by his father and the other gods. So right in the middle of the Kyrlix is the image of the Minotaur. And this is at the point at which he has successfully killed the Minotaur, or at least disabled it, and is dragging it out of the labyrinth. In the interior, uh, the right in the middle, as it says here, this is the BM commentary, within a circle of patterns consisting of sets of three meanders, that's the uh, meanders I've labelled there, um, with checkered squares in between them, Theseus is slaying the Minotaur. Theseus, with sword drawn, sorry, sword in his right hand, moves to the left, looking back at what he has done, dragging with his left hand the Minotaur by the left horn out of a building. Now, as you can see with my annotations here, the building seems to suggest it's the porch or of a palace. If you were to look at Minoan and Mycenaean palaces, you would recognise that kind of architecture with a column holding up that front entrance. 
we've got lots of hair uh, represented by dots all over the upper body of the minotaur which shows it's beast but it's uh, sort of slumpedness shows that it is dead so in the bm commentary we have the minotaur has apparently fallen forward dying only its head right arm and body to the waist are visible the rest being concealed behind the building the surface of his bull's head and human body are covered with brown strokes indicating hair the building is represented by a doric that's the oldest type of column, fluted column with entablature and triglyphs above it, forming a porch to the main building, which is itself represented by a broad vertical stripe of the same patterns that are going around the image. You can possibly see that Mio's meanders as being quite maze-like and possibly representing the maze that the labyrinth was said to be. Uh, it is partly cut off by the border of the design, in this, as in all the other scenes, Theseus is beardless and wears his fillet and a sword belt with a scabbard. So that's how, as well as his interesting hair, we've recognised Theseus all the way through. Now, I just want to show you what the back of the Kilix looks like, because often with these objects, we don't really get to see what they look like from behind. So I, this is my best attempt at taking photographs of it from behind. The way it's put in um, in its show cabinet, you can get around the other side, but it is kind of blocked by other things. Uh, again, this is the British Museum commentary. Here on the exterior, it's the same six scenes again, basically. Here, the six scenes just described are repeated in their corresponding position. So if you were to look on the inside and the outside, forward and back, you'd hopefully see the same image. Each figure, however, standing immediately below the corresponding one of the interior so that their relative positions are reversed. So you can imagine that, you know, it's quite an impressive feat for the painters who have painted the same thing on the inside and the outside. There are slight differences in the points of detail. Uh, in the image of Chromion and the south, the left hand of Chromion leaning on the staffs is drawn back. In uh, the one of Kirkrion, is, he's characterised as a pancreatus, someone who does um, pancration, as you learned about when we did the Pantonite games, by with a bruised face and a large shapeless ear, or sometimes called a cauliflower ear, like he's been beaten up. Uh, and um, between those, uh, between one and two, hang a pilos, uh, um, a spear. And in four, the rock, the, sorry, five, the rock is not shown. And in six, no hill is given, um, possibly because, uh, you know, it's been painted in a slightly different way. And you can see as well that they've got less space on the back because the interior roundel is, is larger, whereas it's quite smaller, uh, quite a bit smaller on the interior of, uh, of the Kinex. Um, no hill is given. Silas merely kneels to the right on the ground line, out of which the pine creed rose. Here again, his body is on fosse and his bent right leg is drawn in bold foreshortening. The human opponents of Theseus throughout all the scenes have an irregular profile and wrinkled forehead in contrast to the regular outline and face of Theseus. Basically, he looks charming and attractive and they look ugly and almost like satyrs uh, with their unkempt hair. So the main points that we should really jot down from this are on the exterior, so the sort of convex bit of the kilix, you've got the same images but reversed, so you would see the same things on the inside and out, but it's a bit like a spot the difference. The painter has done a few different details on this side. This would make this kilix quite a fabulous piece to be drinking out of or using for ceremonies or showing off to your friends. It's so detailed, it tells such a great selection of stories about Theseus, which, you know, as an Athenian, you'd be quite proud of. And it just looks damn cool, really. So let's look at the symbolism. Let me try that again. Let's look at the symbolism of the six labours of Theseus. Now, again, you've got space to jot these ideas down in your packs. Have a think about them first before you listen to my ideas and write them down. And obviously add your own ideas too that you can discuss with your teacher when back in class. So first of all, let's look at the symbolism of the enemies he kills. Bandits, they don't give Xenia. They are evil, they steal stuff, they kill people. Theseus is clever in the way that he outwits them and he's also heroic and pious for taking revenge on them for breaking Zeus's law of Xenia. It also shows his warfare skills in the way that he fights back. So he's clever, heroic and pious and the ability to fight is an important one for men at this time. 
the sow or female bandit and the marathonian bull. So these ones that are not just bandits, but possibly animals. This shows his mastery over beasts. This is hunting skills rather than warfare. And this also links to Heracles with, of course, the marathonian bull. The Minotaur, well, this is a mixture of hunting and warfare skills, and he's also quite clever in that he gets someone to help him get in and out. Uh, there's a magic ball of string involved that he follows uh, going in and then uses to get back out of the maze. There's also mythological super beast in it, and that elevates Theseus' own heroism when he defeats it. If you think about the things he's fought up until this point, he's fought people mostly bandits and when we can compare that to Heracles for a start Heracles fights almost entirely supernatural monsters and he does 12 labors and Theseus mostly fights human monsters and he only does six so the fact then that he gets to fight this mythological super beast the minotaur half man half bull and possibly the most famous now of all of these mythological super beasts in mythology of, of Greece, that really elevates him. It makes him also link with Heracles too. Um, on the other side here, the links to Heracles' labours, both heroes are skilled in warfare and hunting. Both do labours, six is half of 12, it's still a multiple of three. Three is that kind of magic number that we have in storytelling. And they both fight the same bull. The Marathonian bull is possibly the same Cretan bull. And Plus, that bull, the Cretan bull, was the father of the Minotaur with Pacify as well. So we've got all of these stories linked together. And after Heracles captures it and lets it go, after showing it to Eurystheus, it roams round and becomes the Marathonian bull. So there is this direct link between Theseus and Heracles, as well as the other ones such as the club, which neither of them really use very much, but it's certainly a symbol that links them together. Theseus, after the adventures, he becomes king. And this final comic excerpt goes through what happens after he leaves Knossos. So you can read that in your own time or pause the screen and read it or use the link below to visit it on the website if you don't have the pack. And um, you students, you will also have the textbook excerpt for this point to help you answer the questions that I have listed in the packs. They're going to help you learn about what Theseus does after his main adventures, which are listed on the Kilix in pictorial form. Uh, the last thing to point out is this word here, synochismos or synochism. Theseus becomes king of Athens um, it does so in a slightly suspicious way that involves Aegeus throwing himself off the Acropolis out of grief. Think back to the oracle he received. Maybe you can now work out what the bulging wineskin that he loosed open before he got back to Acropolis, which then causes him to die of grief, actually was a... Eh, eh? So he becomes king of Greece. Uh, sorry, no, he doesn't. He becomes king of Athens. He then unites all of Attica, all of the little countryside villages around Athens and the even slightly larger ones. And he introduces this thing, synochismos, which means the, the, the living together. Whereas they had all been individual city-states before, he kind of unifies them in an amalgamation of villages in Greece into, into one uh, big polis or, or several, several polis, it's these city-states. Now, this is not democracy. He does not introduce democracy. But what he does is he unifies Attica under Athens. And this also frees Attica from the rule of Crete, King Minos, cruelly making them give tribute to that he could feed people to his Minotaur. And it makes you think maybe the Minotaur story was actually just made up as anti-Cretan propaganda. I mean, it makes more sense than there being an actual you know, bull man beast. Come on. So um, this is something that Theseus is really famous for. And one of the things he's actually most famous for in Athens, because, of course, if you unify everyone under Athens, it makes Athens the greatest. But still, it did a lot of good for a lot of people in the area. So even though we might find him to be the most famous for, you know, killing the Minotaur and all his other labours, this is actually something that a lot of people do consider his greatest achievement. So your last thing to do, my students, is to read the textbook extracts and answer those questions in your pack 
ready to bring that pack into school to continue learning about the foundation myths, but of Rome once term starts again. It has been my pleasure as ever to be your teacher, no matter how distant, and I wish you all the best for next year.